Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode uh, in this social psych lecture series. Today's or this episode, this video's episode is going to be on discrimination and a little bit of reducing prejudice. Not a lot on reducing prejudice because I'm, we're going to talk about that more in the live stream. Um, but I do want to give some foundation on that one. So we're going to talk about discrimination in this. And then we're going to talk about um, reducing prejudice and obviously eliminate and hopefully that then eliminates uh, prejudice, right? <laughs> or discrimination. Um, so I found this uh, fairly punny, innocuous uh, comic. So I hope you enjoyed that one from Oddball Today. Yeah, Oddball Today. And hit the mic there. Okay, so like I said, we're going to do a little bit of discrimination. I'm going to talk about um, what discrimination is in general, uh, institutional discrimination, privilege, and then a moment to discuss uh, Jane Elliott, a school teacher um, who is fairly prolific in this realm. And um, again, it's one of those topics that is difficult, but we got to talk about it anyways. It's it's got to be what we do um, in this in this class. Uh, so we are going to be talking um, about hard topics, and um, I will mention a few current events and what the whole deal is with uh, institutional discrimination. What racism really then brings to the table. And um, how privilege um, affects how people see and do things related to uh, racism, sexism, etc. Okay. Uh, and then um, a little bit, like I said, on reducing prejudice. So what are the issues surrounding that? I'll talk about the contact type, contact hypothesis and the cooperation hypothesis in relation to and couched within the robber's cave experiment. And then um, I feel like today's stuff really, really needs some updated voices and potentially voices from BIPOC or POC, um, B-I-P-O-C, so... Um, those individuals. And I do have a couple of resources related to that, but more these are more broadly uh, resources to help with a lot of the current situation that's going on. Okay. So, final piece to the ABC model of bias. ABC model of bias. We're at the B part. So, again, cab model, really. Uh, we're at the B part, behavior, and so stereotypes and prejudice manifest in behaviors that are related to discrimination, that are discrimination. And so the definition that I want you to know about discrimination is that they are unjustified, negative, or harmful actions toward members of groups because of their membership of that group. Plain and simple. There's no other. Uh, it, it, that's like the simplest definition that I can give you. A negative or harmful action uh, to someone just because of their membership in a group. Perceived or real. Right. They could be you know, for for um, um, lots of things. This could be perceived, but for other things, it's real. Right. Um, and it can be a personal thing. Or it can be an institutional thing. So like um, like what we're saying, uh, what we're seeing recently, more black men are uh, pulled over, um, are harassed by police than any other uh, minority or any other person, right? Um, or it could be personal, like I said, as a refusing to hire a male babysitter, for example. So something inherently wrong with men that can't they can't uh you know be good caretakers of children uh, it, you know that that uh that's one of those things where dads are called the babysitter and it's like no we're parenting um and like a lot of the stuff we'll be talking about 
will be uh, mentioning uh, race quite a bit, racism, uh, but the gender wage gap still exists, okay? Um, you, by this uh, pretty interesting um, image here, uh, you can see that the male is very happy and um, he has a giant piggy bank and the the woman in this um, has a smaller piggy bank and she's looking as though she uh, wants to smash his piggy bank, I think. Something like that. I think something like that. But um, anyways, uh, it's... It's entirely crazy. And here's one crazy thing that um, I learned from my friend and I decided to keep around in this lecture is until a few years ago, until a few years ago, uh, there was a law on the books that said, no, I don't want that. <laughs> that said, if you're stopped and found carrying condoms, you can be arrested for prostitution. Just because you have condoms, right? If that's not discrimination towards somebody who wants to practice safe sex, I don't know what is. Let's not hit that microphone or the microphone stand. Cool. So consider that. That's, that's an interesting form of discrimination. Uh, there. Oh, there's a colorful packs of condoms, colorful packs of condoms. And how you can tell is even if you couldn't figure out what the hell was going on here with these multicolored ones, there's a direct one right there. So there's condoms, right? Uh, other examples include uh, Arizona's uh, Senate Bill 1070, which legalized racial profiling, um, asking for documentation, which was quite reminiscent of uh, Jews in Nazi Germany and surrounding areas. Uh, they had to always constantly have papers with them. So this was back during Sheriff Arpaio's uh, reign. Uh, he is in jail, I believe, or he got pardoned. No, nah, he got pardoned. Um, yeah. So... <laughs> It's interesting to think about all of the ways that, that the majority in society can discriminate and affect people of regardless of anything about them, right? Uh, an additional one. So this is from several years ago. Military sexual assaults. And you may have recently heard about something that uh, is going on down at Fort Hood. Uh, it's not it's not great. Sixty four percent increase since 2006. And that was until about 2012, somewhere around there. So in about six years, an increase of nearly two thirds of the amount of sexual assaults just within the military. OK, uh, Liz Trotta in this picture said when she was talking about this that um, those women should expect to get raped be just because they're in the military. We'll talk about more rape more in a future video on aggression. Okay. Uh, in New York City, trans individuals, although this has gotten a smidge better, are routinely harassed, strip search, and chain defense, chain to fences even for minor infractions, like using the wrong subway card, okay? So these acts of discrimination are often the behavioral consequences of prejudice, right? So you have a stereotype, you create a negative feeling about that, the, the folks within the stereotype, and then you act on those, stere th those, those prejudices, okay? So it's what we do. And... If you have enough learning that this is the right thing to do or the thing that you find to be the moral thing, you are still harming another person 
or another group by the mere fact that they are a member of that group or the, that they're uh, the group themselves. So all the things that you hear about this, you know, bread makers don't want to make um, wedding cakes for gay couples and it being couched as some sort of religious thing. And I don't, um, and it, it, it comes off as, okay, well, your religion says it's okay to discriminate against people, which is not okay. Religion says we should not discriminate against anybody, right? So recognize that all of the things about power turn into discrimination. All power wants to do is hold on to power. And so whoever has the power wants to hold on to that power. And so structures are created to keep power in place. And then, of course, humans don't like change, and thus the status quo bias says, hey, let's just keep things the way that they are. So discrimination, in a nutshell, is cruelty. It's cruelty. And they end up becoming extreme acts when you talk about how black men are, are murdered for running a stop sign. Or Breonna Taylor killed in her sleep. It's, it becomes cruel. Men, white men, going and shooting up Jewish community centers or temples. Other people running to churches and slaughtering dozens of people. They become extreme acts of cruelty. Extreme acts of cruelty. And I'll tell you what, um, this relates back to group polarization. Because remember, group polarization is that whatever uh, I, I, uh, attitude you have about one position or the other, if you're in a group of people with the same one, the attitude becomes more extreme. Okay? And so that's what's happening with these folks that go and commit these extreme acts of cruelty. The discrimination ideas, the prejudices, the discrimination gets so cruel and so just in your face, it becomes extreme to those people and then they go and commit those gigantic acts of extreme cruelty. Okay. Now, I do want to spend a smidge amount of time on institutional discrimination. Okay. Because it's in pretty much everything that you grew up with. It's in everything you grew up with. Okay. Discrimination in employment. So I'll give you one piece to that one, and then I'll move on to the other ones. Discrimination in employment. Okay, so what is institutional discrimination in employment? Well, I'll give you an example. So when you are convicted of a crime and you are sent to jail or prison, depending on how long the service uh the the service requirement of the sentence is um most places after you get out won't hire you because you are a convicted felon okay that idea notwithstanding that's a different topic for a different day the idea that i want to use with that that convicts cannot get jobs is that the structure of prisons and the uh, people who are in them reflect the then future discrimination in employment. And this is just one thing. So who makes up the vast majority of the prison population, uh, jail and prison population in the United States? Minorities. Those tend to be black individuals. Okay. So that's institutional discrimination in employment. That's just one. Okay. Housing. You may have heard of redlining. Uh, redlining is a practice where you basically draw a red line on a city, on a street or something like that. And um, it was a very common practice uh, 
30, 40, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, 70 years ago, where um, if you were in the red line district, that is where African-Americans and other minority populations could buy homes. Outside of the red line, that's where white families bought homes. Well, what happens is in the red line district, those property values don't increase. Outside the red line district, those property values increase significantly. Okay, if the neighborhood stays, you know, if the neighborhood is nice. But regardless of the red line district being nice or not, you end, it ends up getting less funding, less support, fewer um, social services, fewer parks. What ends up happening is that more of that area becomes concrete and asphalt, which holds on to heat more during the summer. And that ends up increase heat and ends up increasing violent acts. And you it, you end up in this vicious cycle because of this one housing practice. Credit markets. Credit markets. So um credit favors assets. And if you are poor because you don't have any and you don't have any assets then you won't have a good credit score. And who is most likely poor? Minorities, black, Latinx, etc. So credit markets favor having assets. Who has those assets? Majority Americans, white. Okay. Consumer pricing. Consumer pricing. Um, I don't have a, a specific example of this one, but uh, the idea is. The idea is that uh, um, food from the grocery store is kind of expensive, but only healthy foods, but only healthy foods. Cheap foods tend to be processed foods. Processed foods are bad for you. And so you get that, you get the sense that, that that's not great. Okay. Um, disproportional prison sentences for black Americans, like I said, including death sentences, quite disproportional for who, who's on death row. So there's obviously the innocent project that has been around for decades. Um, this is as decades since DNA testing came out. Um, but, uh, so they have, the, they have the innocence project and I believe there's a documentary on a streaming service. Maybe it's Netflix. Uh, about the Innocence Project, and um, the vast majority of the Innocent uh, Innocence Project uh, success stories are of black men who are convicted of raping and murdering somebody, generally speaking, as a, um, a white person. But DNA evidence exonerates them because they didn't do it, right? Um, they're more likely to be on death row. Um, and I do recommend how we got here is 13th on Netflix. It's just called 13th. Um, and uh, it is a revelation for the 13th Amendment of the United States of America, uh, the U.S. Constitution, the 30, 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution on how slavery was ended and, and abolished in the United States in 1865. But not unless you are uh, convicted of a crime and serve prison time or jail time, then you can still be enslaved. Just think about that for a minute. You got convicted of a crime, and now you have to be a slave. That's pretty rough. Pretty rough. The other thing that I wanted to spend a little bit of time on is privilege. Privilege. I mean, you might hear this as white privilege because that's that's really what it is. That's what it is. It's white privilege. Okay. Um, 
Twine in 2013 has a pretty good definition of it. It's the perceived rights or advantages that are assumed to be available only to a particular person or group of people. The term is commonly used in the context of social inequality, particularly in regard to age, disability, ethnic, racial category, uh, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, religion, and social class. That is a lot of social categories. And the people with privilege are the young, the enabled, white, male, cis, uh, het uh, heterosexual or straight, Christian, and middle class or upper class. Those are the people with privilege. Okay. Now, that, I just defined me. I just defined me. So, I recognize that I have privilege in this country. And that, while I may have had some hardships growing up, that, has nothing to do, those hardships has, have nothing to do with any of those things that I labeled, that I just labeled. It has nothing to do with any of the things that I just labeled. And Kimmel in 2009, not, not to be confused with Jimmy Kimmel, uh, the state of having privilege is like running with the wind at your back unaware of invisible sustenance, support, and propulsion. So, again, privilege has nothing to do with the hardships you may have faced growing up. If you are a member of any of the groups, the majority groups that I labeled in here, young, abled, uh, white, male, cis, heterosexual or straight, Christian, or middle class, you had privilege in any of those things that affect how you then grow up and the opportunities that you receive and uh, the amount of money that you make, the um, possibility that you'll be shot accidentally or maybe not accidentally. It, 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 it is the wind at your back. Okay? It's an invisible force that is thrusting you forward. So just recognize that. That's all I want you to do is recognize that. Okay. So the day after Martin Luther King was assassinated in 1968, an Iowa school teacher named Jane Elliott gave her third grade class students firsthand experience in the meaning of discrimination. You may have heard of this. This is the this is the green eye, brown, or excuse me, green eye, blue eye, brown eye uh, uh, thing. Thing. Uh, this is the story of what she taught children and the impact that the lesson had on their life. So she did this. It turned out to be super great. It got national press in 1968. Then a, a film crew came out and um, asked her to do it again. So she did it with a new group of, of kids. She did the exact same thing, and they got it all on film, and it is it is uh, it is in insane. So the full documentary is "The Eye of the Storm." I'm not obviously going to show <laughs> the class this in this video. Um, you can also search "Take a Walk in My Shoes" on YouTube for more recent demonstrations. She's an older woman; she has short white hair. That's how you'll know that you found the right documentary, and and uh, she like the. They filmed those in like the 80s and 90s. I think 90s really is what end up is what is what it's doing. Um, yeah, it's uh, <laughs> it's wild and it's only based on whether or not you had blue eyes or brown eyes. And, and, and you can you can bet. You can bet that. Um. What do I want to say? You can bet that the blue eyed folks in this are. Are uh, the. Privileged ones and the brown eyed folks are the non privileged ones. Watch these kids crumble. Watch these kids crumble at this story. I think it's a great story. 
Um, it does have its problems. It's it's not perfect. It's not a perfect demonstration. But to a group of white kids who were in, you know, the third grade, eight, you know, a bunch of white eight year olds in in Iowa, I think it's it's eye opening to them. And uh, and I think they found those some of those kids afterward. And I think maybe that is in the it's been a while since I've seen the documentary Eye of the Storm. Um but I think they found those some of those kids who grew up and and asked them, you know, what their life was like after that experience. Um, so and and those are the kids that were in the uh, redo. How do we reduce this prejudice stuff? This is some um, this is hard stuff, isn't it? It's hard stuff. And so the stuff that I stuff, I keep saying stuff. It's been a long day. The um, the things that I want to talk about in this part uh, are by no means, by no means exhaustive, by no means exhaustive. And you may have come across ways in which to do stuff recently with, you know, the um, Elijah McClain, the George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, uh, ways to reduce prejudice ideas from them. And I think that's useful. I think I think you should. So. And the reason why this is hard is because we're talking about changing values and beliefs by which people live. These are. Ingrained in their bodies and in their minds, it's really difficult to do anything related to this. And so if you are going to embark on an effort to reduce prejudice, just know that it's going to be a struggle. Just know that it's going to be tough and set yourself up for the fact that it's going to be tough, but hopefully rewarding in the sense that I'm going to feel good about this. So the challenges to somebody changing include values and beliefs that are integral to somebody's psychological security. Okay. You change somebody's worldview and then they kind of crumble. Okay, prejudice often serves a psychological function for people. Established prejudice views and stereotypes are self-perpetuating schemas. They are more accessible, and so they happen more frequently. And, you know, you just you kind of get locked into those thought patterns. And it's very hard to break those thought, thought patterns. And then, of course, there are the subset of people that are unaware of their prejudice and how prejudice um, influences people. So recognize that, that they might not be aware of it. So there are some tutorials um, on Twitter and Facebook these days that uh, say, OK, first thing you want to do is tell somebody this is how this is how you're behaving. This is what issues we have with your um thinking and your behavior and you you have to kind of work up to it it's very tiring it's very tiring uh the other thing that you can do the other thing that you can do is you can change the culture Woo! this one's super tough this one's super tough um and it's slow this one's slow it's not going to happen overnight it's not going to happen overnight. A lot of people want it to happen overnight. Unfortunately, culture doesn't work like that. But we are trying to change it as, as slowly as we can. So one of the ways that you change things is change the institutional structure. Brown versus the Board of Education eliminated segregation in schools, in public schools. Okay. So that was one way. Another way to do it is change the way that minorities and um, other people of color are portrayed in films. There's a good documentary called Disclosure on Netflix right now that talks about how trans people are portrayed and, the, and, and many trans folks are like, there's no wonder why um, people fear us uh, have negative visceral reactions uh, from us because of how we're portrayed in popular media. The characters that are trans in those works 
are negative, 100% negative, right? And so you get those, you have to change those cultural structures. You have to change how the media portrays those. And one of the ways is by, you know, um, uh, a show like Scandal, right? Get a strong, intelligent, high-status African-American woman as the lead character and have her be an amazing person, right? As somebody who gets things done, is likable, and all of those things, and it could be an effective means for changing stereotypes over time, right? So it's not going to happen overnight. Prejudice isn't always easily controlled. Many of our biases are implicit, as the other videos and other discussions have explored. When people attempt to control their biases, they may have other issues. Okay? So cognitive control is impaired when a person is aroused or upset. And so even though police officers get implicit Bias training, whatever whatever that might be, whatever form that takes, right? They might be cognizant of now their implicit biases or the biases that they had that they didn't know they had uh, growing up or even on the job, but get them in a tense situation and all of that goes out the window. All of that leaves. It's now back to the implicit control of those biases in that moment. No amount of implicit bias training is going to change that unless you incorporate the situations where the bias rears its head, and that is when arousal and um, anger and aggression and uh, fear are all coalescing. You know, how do you, t how do you fix that stuff? That's really difficult, right? Okay. Um, and then trying to control biases can have some negative effects. Not to say don't try it. I'm just saying that there could be potential negative effects. Okay. Exerting control in one context makes it more difficult to do in other contexts. Remember, the situation changes the way we behave. And so thus, we have potential issues when we try to control in one situation that doesn't necessarily match another situation. It's tough. It's tough. All right, so how do we do this? How do we do this? Well, I'm going to talk about two things. I'm going to talk about the contact hypothesis, and then I'm going to talk about the cooperation hypothesis. Okay, so let's first talk about contact, and then we'll get into cooperation. And like I said, I'm going to couch this with these two within the robber's cave experiment. So Alport first came up with the contact hypothesis. Intergroup contact is what it's called. So any group, any group talking to another group. Okay. So we have the um, pieces of this. So equal status between groups in a situation. Okay. You can't, contact will not work if there is no equal status. And so which is why contact is shown not to be working in situations like um, African American communities and white communities clashing together. It we you clear or conservative and liberal ideas that are, are they're in constant uh, contact with each other, but there's not equal status between the groups because of other factors. Okay, intimate and varied contact that allows people to get acquainted. Okay, so desegregating is important for contact. You can't just stay apart. You got to intermingle. Intergroup cooperation toward a superordinate goal. To see, here's the thing. You can talk about a cooperative goal, but is, if you don't put it in practice, it's not going to work. It's not going to happen. Okay? And then the institution must offer support, right? Whether that's the government, the university, um, the churches, whatever. The institutions need to support this contact. Okay, so again, robber's cave. So Sharif and colleagues okay, uh, tested the contact hypothesis 
as well as the cooperation hypothesis, which is this uh, this third bullet point here, at a uh, state park in uh, New Jersey, Robbers Cave, it's Robbers Cave State Park. And so there was camping here. And in the, I believe it was 1950s. Did I have that in my notes? 1950s. Um, no, I believe it was in the 1950s, though. Um, okay, so this is called the Robbers Cave Experiment. Muzaver Sharif and a number of uh, colleagues tried to re do realistic contact or conflict theory. Okay, what is realistic conflict theory? This is biases that arise from actual conflict over real or perceived resources, like land, huh, money, hmm, power, hmm, military protection, and status. Conflict is viewed as zero sum, right? So there is a winner and there is a loser. Okay? Only one person or group can win, okay? which leads to resentment and hostility, right? So that's what Robber's Cave was meant to do, okay? 200-acre summer camp uh, in Oklahoma. Sorry, not in um, New Jersey, in Oklahoma. My bad. Um, and so what they did was they had several stages. It's divided into three stages. The first stage was in-group formation. So the boys, and this was a boys-only camp, Boys only camp. Uh, ages ranged from 11 and 12. Okay. And there were 22 of them. So there are teams of 11, two teams of 11. That was stage one in group formation. Okay. The boys were split into two approximately equal groups based on their similarities. When the group, when the boys arrived, they were housed in separate cabins for the first week and did not know about the existence of the other group, okay? So they were completely separated, completely separated. They spent this time bonding with each other while swimming and hiking. Both groups chose a name, which they had stenciled on their shirts and flags. One group was the Eagles, and the other group was the Rattlers, okay? Eagles and Rattlers, Rattlers, Rat, Rattlers, okay? Stage two was the friction phase. This is when they were like, all right, come together, boys. So the boys came together and they were put into competitions with one another, okay? Now that the groups were established, okay, they were allowed to find out about each other and soon the signs of intergroup conflict merged, okay? Started with name calling and then moved on from name calling so they increased, so and the experimenters had a hand in increasing the um, conflict. They pitted the goops against each other in a series of those competitions, okay, like tug of war, capture the flag, etc. Okay, this increased the antagonism in the group. Okay, this increased the antagonism in the group. Uh, among, amongst groups. Now, the interesting thing is that they tallied up points from all these competitions, and the Rattlers run the overall trophy for the competitive activities, and they didn't let the Eagles forget it. Okay. The Rattlers stake their claim to the ball field by planting their flag on it. Later on, each group started uh, eat, uh, started name calling at each other and singing derogatory songs. That's so cute. Soon, the groups were refusing to eat in the same room together. Okay. So here's a graph of uh, eagles and rattlers. Okay. And the question that they asked was, are all the members in the other group Cheats and sneaks, yes or no? Okay. You can see here that it, um, that uh, one group were 
divided. Half of them said, yeah, all of them are cheats and sneaks. And the other half was like, yeah. But this group, nearly 80% was like, oh my goodness. Yes, they're all cheats and sneaks. I love the 1950s. Cheats and sneaks. Cheats and sneaks. Okay. Yeah, contact doesn't seem to work, does it? Let's just throw a bunch of rival gangs in a room together and let them work it out, right? Let's put some Crips and Bloods in there, right? That that might work, yeah? Yeah. However, you can clearly see that just by contact alone, it doesn't work. Now, there was a final phase. So here's where the uh, Sharif team thought of a solution to the conflict, and that was cooperation, right? Following all fours. How do we make these two groups like each other and, and have that work for them? How do we do that? How do we do that? Well, one of the ways that they did that was they tried a couple of things. Okay, They were brought together, they watched a film, and they shot firecrackers. Didn't really work. At the film viewings, they sat on opposite sides and snickered at each other. Okay, Shooting firecrackers, they would shoot it at each other. At the, obviously a different group, I mean. Okay, And that's because there was no equal status. The Rattlers won the overall trophy. They were the supreme group in the in the in the land, right? They were the supreme group. So you have to level the playing field. And one of the ways that the playing field is leveled is by making the common gr in group identity salient. So how do they do that? Well, they did this by adding some flavor to the contact and then plopping up cooperation. So what are the ways that we do? Uh, what are the ways that con optimal contact will increase the salient in-group identity? You got to reduce stereotyping. You got to reduce anxiety. And you have to foster empathy. Those are the three ways that contact will begin to work. Okay. You have to understand where you are before you move on to what you can do, okay? So solution part two, solution part two is that they took the groups to a new location and gave them a series of problems to try and solve. In the first problem, the boys were told a drinking water supply had been attacked by vandals. After the second, uh, after the two groups successfully worked together to unblock a faucet, the first seeds of peace were sown. In the second problem, the two groups had to club together to pay for the movie they wanted to watch. Both groups had to agree on which movie they should watch. By the evening, the members of groups were once again eating together. In another uh, version of this, um, they have to unstick a truck from a muddy ditch. Okay. Um, which was accidental, <laughs> accidental. No, they weren't accidental. So the, the truck was put there by the researchers and the camp organizers and they came across it. So they had to unstick a truck and all of them had to do it right. They were 11 and 12 years old. They had to figure it out. These trucks were huge back then. The key thing was that they involved superordinate goals. Boys from both groups worked together to achieve something they had an interest in. Finally, all the boys decided to travel home together in the same bus. He said broken out all over. Now, does this end racism? Are we like, yeah, racism is done? No. Um, all of those boys were white. Let's not forget that. All of those boys were white. They could, they didn't have to deal 
with some of the other baggage that comes with real life intergroup conflict. So just keep that in mind. It's a good start, but just keep that in mind. And so they were asked about the cheats and sneaks thing again, and you can see that um, upon cooperation, most of the boys did not think anybody else on the other team was a cheat or a sneak, which I think is a win. These are significant de decreases um, from phase one to phase two, or sorry, phase two to phase three. Now, how? what other ways can we uh, increase cooperation? One of those ways is by using a jigsaw, uh, jigsaw classroom. Um, instead of having uh, homogenous teams, you mix those teams up. You mix those teams up, and so you have a lot. And you can go to jigsaw.org if you want to hear more about this. This is from um, Aronson in 1971 in Austin, Texas. Him and his graduate students invented it and um and and they said it was the you know invention is the uh, mother of all necessity or something like that but they anyways they had to diffuse a explosive situation the city schools had recently been desegregated in 1971 or the late 60s and because austin had always been racially segregated white youngsters black youngsters and hispanic youngsters found themselves in the same classroom okay and so if you want to think about that, that is how what these one, two, threes, and fours represent. Okay. And so you end up with mixed groups, a white kid, a black kid, a Hispanic kid, and maybe an Asian kid. I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure what the racial makeup of Austin in 1971 was, but you can imagine that these groups were that way. Okay. So that's what these mixed groups were were saying. Um, there's been uh, a number of re uh, a number of research. What are the benefits of the jigsaw technique? First and foremost, it is remarkably efficient way to learn materials. So you have these groups do various pieces of a problem, and then you bring it together, which I think is pretty cool. I'm not going to go through all of it. Um, but more importantly, the jigsaw process encourages listening, engagement, and empathy by giving each member of the group an essential part to play in the academic activity. Group members must work together as a team to accomplish a common goal. Each person depends on all the others. No student can succeed completely unless everyone works well together as a team. This cooperation by design facilitates interaction among all students in the class, leading to them valuing each other as contributors to a common task. So this is cooperation in motion in a school. Okay. And then the last thing for this video are additional resources, uh, and these are current resources, and so they will be mentioning current issues and current events in the United States happening right now, George, uh, George Floyd being the... Um, first and foremost instigator uh, event for many of these uh, links. Um, but we have the Greater Good Laboratory or, or Center at Berkeley, breakingprejudice.org. I've seen all over the internet as a great uh, uh, resource for how to um, both do it in yourself and uh, in others. Uh, Dr. Kim Case has a number of resources to help you out with this. And then tolerance.org. This link takes you to uh, current events on how to, uh, I, I believe, how to talk to, to folks about what's happening in um, all across the country. Uh, and, and but the you could just peruse tolerance.org, really. Um, it's probably a good idea. Probably a good idea. Uh, so these are just a few of them. I do recommend reading uh, reading Black and other BIPOC, um, BIPOC authors and their take. Only if they have written it, don't go out and asking them, hey, tell me about this. Um, that's not what they're here for. Uh, so if they've written something, read it is what I'm saying. 
okay and amplify those voices and that'll be do that'll be it for this video so please go ahead and leave your comments suggestions and feedback down below until the next video bye